once you start smoking, you just want to smoke. Your pipes get bigger. Do you know what I mean? The hits get bigger, the snowballs get completely out of control, and that's why you end up smoking so much. I would say I had a habit of about 300 pound a day. I'm still 16 years old, and now all of a sudden I'm getting involved in street robberies and burglaries and just crazy. I was someone who had a knife, a gun, imitation firearm, screwdriver whatever it was i was a weapons guy i used to carry weapons with me and my thing was to get money from people and i become very ruthlessly efficient at that it doesn't matter how big you are it doesn't matter how gangster you think you are if you've got something people in that life want the 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 majority of the time people are going to take that off of you i don't ask anyone for sympathy I put myself in there, I committed those crimes, I deserved every single day of the 22 years I served. I'm not a gangster, I'm not an ex-gangster, I'm an ex-prisoner, I'm a recovering addict who just wants to show people that, you know, you can really turn your life around. Welcome back to KRN TV. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, please like, share and subscribe if you enjoy this content, which I'm sure you will. Today got another fantastic guest who's got an absolute crazy story for spending over 22 years behind bars, over 22 prisons, homelessness, addiction, violence, trauma, abuse. He's been through it all. Thankfully, he's made it out the other end, turned his life around the last few years, doing lots of positive stuff, trying to help people that are on the wrong path. Without further ado, Paul Simmons, how are we doing, brother? I'm really well, thank you. Good intro, man. Thank you, thank you. So, um, yeah, again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, obviously, seen you over the last couple of years, doing really good stuff. And obviously, it's great that we can actually do it together and uh, get you on the platform. Sweet. Thank you, man. I, I, you know, your platform's really good. You know, I've done a few of these. And I'm here today just to, to really get some honesty out there. Because we see a lot of guys doing these podcasts. A lot of guys who have come through the system, I'm fair play to them, they're not going back to jail and they're representing. But 80% or more of prisoners are drug addicts. They struggle through prison, like I did. For a lot of those 22 years, man, I was in a dark place. I really struggled a lot. So that's what I'm here to tell today. Well, to fair play to you. Like I said, it's all about being as real as possible. And the pro problem with prisoners and offenders and I'm not saying about them I've been one myself is um we're great at manipulating and putting on a front and hard to actually admit what's actually really going on inside so yeah take my hat off for you for your honesty over the last few years thank you and actually telling the real story which is what it's all about but um so obviously first time on the channel let's go back to start your story um your story started in Bristol didn't it yeah so I'm born and bred Bristol boy I'm 1978 South Mead Hospital uh I'm the son of a white mum and uh, basically a, a white stepdad. So I was brought up in quite, it was a weird sort of situation, unfortunately. My my old man really struggled. I was a naughty kid, let's not mess around. Yeah, I was a naughty kid. I was into lighting fires, you know, I was nicking stuff with no needs, just a real pain in the ass kid. And my old man didn't know how to deal with that. And unfortunately, that led to quite extreme abuse. You know, uh, we're talking not just getting punched and slapped and, you know, we're talking dog leads. Man used to come out with me Stanley knives and stuff. It was real messed up, uh, not only physical abuse, but it was real psychological abuse as well. Really used to be scared to go to sleep and stuff. Still love the guy. Don't get me, don't get it twisted. He did not know how to deal with a crazy kid. But what happened to me, it's not really acceptable. It wouldn't happen today. If it happened today, you know, the, the guy would be sit, sat in a jail cell. He's passed now, so I try not to go too deep into it because I don't, you know, I don't feel no way about it. I always say, you, you know, you concentrate on the past for too long, you get a sore neck. 
And that's what I believe in. It's about moving forward. So that was my early childhood. That's what I was around. It was horrid. And in 1987-88, I was put into care. So I went to, first I went to a secure unit in Bristol, Vinnie Green. That was kind of crazy. They slipped me out of there, put me into a couple of children's homes. I ended up in a reform school in Bath Ford. It was called Wally Manor. It doesn't exist anymore for anyone who knows. Most schools that don't exist anymore, they don't exist for a reason. And this one was rife with abuse. There's only 60 kids, but we were 60 of the most just messed up kids. You know, we've come from all sorts of abuses, mental health issues. There wasn't ADHD back then. There, there wasn't any of these disorders that we have today. We were just identified as naughty children. So this school was a reform school. And basically that's pre-prison. 100% that's what I was about yeah. to say, you're just getting programmed ready for, it's literally junior prison. It you was, go there, then you go to the YOs, then you go to prison, it's all the same. That's exactly what happened and I've talked about this before, but when you are getting twisted up like a prison officer as a child, right, that is, you know, programming you, getting you used to, getting you ready for what was around the corner. I left that school at 16. I, it was messed up, you know. I'd been abused from home, from yeah. school. I don't need to go. I've talked about this Absolutely before. Absolutely messed short at that point. But So going back slightly, obviously, yeah. you said you were a mischievous boy. Yeah. Like most boys are. I don't think there's anything wrong in that. And obviously it was difficult home life. Yeah. Was he their stepdad being violent towards your mum as well? Was he quite controlling of there? Was it just a lot of alcohol? Mm. It was just a generally abusive environment? It was... There was alcohol involved. There was always a bottle of vodka and a bottle of whiskey in my house, and it was a daily buy. Right? So, you know, the end of every night, they were they were what we call today at-home alcoholics, closet alcoholics. Went to work, everything was fine and dandy. In the evening, they'd get steaming. Uh, me and my older brother, we both went through the same abuse. My mum, um, I don't really remember... If she, I, you know, they had arguments, you know, they did have a lot of arguments, but I couldn't say that she, she faced the physical violence that myself and my older brother John did, because we really did. We went through the rig, rigmarole. And it's really because recently I started speaking to my brother and he started opening up to me. And it's just, yeah, it was pretty messed up for two of us, really. Of course. And, um, Obviously, with all this going on, did you start drinking and taking drugs at a really young age? Was this while you were at home, pre nine years old? Yeah. Um, when did this start, or did you? So I was stealing their alcohol for as far back as I can remember. I was smoking pot as far back as I can remember. Uh, I'd done uh, amphetamines, a speed bomb before I was in double figures, yeah. do you know what I mean? But that was all experimentation. There was no there was no addiction in there. It was just, I just wanted to get off my head. There was so much going on in my life. I just wanted to get off my head. So I was drinking a lot, uh, being a Bristol boy, a lot of cider, a lot of Thunderbird, <laughs> you know. We go back to them days. Uh, it was mad, and I used to like run away from home. That's what I was going to ask, yeah. So. so I did a lot of running away from home before, you know, before I was old enough to know better, really. But I knew my bad behaviour would lead to me getting beat up. So I would misbehave, not really thinking about the consequences, and then not, really um, not wanting to deal with the consequences, so I wouldn't go home. And... That happens, I couldn't tell you the amount of times I jumped out of my bedroom window because I knew my dad was on his way home from work and I knew what that would entail. You know, I've got friends now who I speak to who they, they're, they're like, what we didn't realise when you were coming round to our house for something to eat, that you were actually escaping 
the, the craziness because that's what it was. I, you know, kids don't understand when you're kids. And when I used to be out later than everyone else and hanging around when, when everyone else was going home, they didn't understand. That was me just basically going, I can't go home. Can I come stay at yours for a little bit? Of course. And what about um, first rest brushes with the lawn? That would, but you must have had some early ones then. So, <sighs> I had lots of brushes with the lawn. The very earliest is, I, I don't think I've talked about this before, but my, the very earliest brush of the lawn was, I was six years old, um, I set my house on fire. It was stupid. On it purpose? Was, uh, no, not on purpose. Uh, I was, pyro, uh, I was pyro. I was a pyro playing with matches Christmas Eve, this was. Uh, I set fire to the sofa. Fuck. Yeah. In the middle, so the sofa, you know, you've got Christmas tree lights, all of that set oh, fire well, to the that sofa. Time year, so. That time of year, you know, we're talking 80s, so the sofa, you know, you, you put a match to it, it goes up. And I remember trying to put it out, I couldn't put it out. What did I do? I just ran back upstairs to my bed, you know, like an idiot kid, just put my head under the blankets and hoping it'd all go away. Uh, lots of people got injured in my family for lots of it. it was real bad sort of real bad situation so I'd go to the hospital for I got some scarring on my legs and stuff and I remember coming out of the hospital in my dad's car they clearly knew it was me they knew it wasn't an accident they knew I'd set this fire and they took me to the police station I was six years old remember six they took me to Norwest West Police Station in Bristol and sat me in a cell and was like, if you continue doing this, this is where you're going to end up. I was six when they did that. Crazy. And then I spent 22 years in the cell. Of course. So. <laughs> I thought you got the beating of all beatings over. Oh, that, that one listen, and it, it continued. That was the problem. Because of that incident, it continued and everything would be a reminder of people of, I did this I was trying to beat stuff out of you. Yeah, point. trying to beat it out of you. And I don't know if anyone realises, it doesn't work. It just obviously <laughs> it puts the violence into you. Yeah, it just, it turned me into a yeah. ruthless, ruthless, like just a nasty piece of work, really. So, and yeah. so obviously while this is all going on, this is obviously primary school sort of yeah. stuff. School must have been an absolute write-off because obviously the sort of abuse, stuff like this is going on at home, the violence, you're going in there and obviously trying to lash out at certain yeah, points. Uh, and so how did you get on at primary school? Were you troublesome at school or did you sort of get through it or get expelled or suspended? And Oh, uh, primary school's really weird. Um, like I said, my behaviour definitely went into the classroom. I would uh, play up, be the class clown, but also be really, really disrespectful. Education's never been an issue for me, and it's really like, I've, for a lot of people, they don't quite understand it, but I've always been all right with education. You sit me down, do a course, I'll do that course. Do you know what I mean? I've been very, very lucky. But it was just all the other stuff that, ended up with me getting shipped out to the to to the reform school because I just wasn't getting on. You gotta imagine I'm getting beat up at night and the next morning they're expecting me to go into school uh, and study like all the other kids. And in my head I it's all of that's going over and thinking, am I gonna get the same tonight when I go home? You know, it was absolutely just of course. Brutal. As you know, uh, um, nine years old when social services have come to a point where they've ended up coming to take you, yeah. was there a, a major incident that sort of happened or was it accumulation? I know you said that you went end up in hospital dozens of times, yeah. which is horrific. Was there like it had been accumulation that got to that point and um, were you happy to be leaving home at that point? I think it was an accumulation. I don't think there was any one thing that I would class as over one thing was more serious than another. You know, bruises were appearing on me. I was going to school, you know, swimming, gym, all of that stuff, what you do as a kid. They see this stuff. So it was definitely more of an accumulation. And um, to tell you I was glad is an understatement. Even at that young age, I thought I believed with everything in my heart that I was going to be rescued. That's what I thought I thought was going to be rescued. And 
unfortunately that didn't turn out to be the case but at the time i was very happy to get out of that situation i didn't like it of course and also you're hoping to go into a nice foster family or something like this maybe yeah. you have kids who are desperate for a child and instead you've ended up going into this residential boarding school with lots of well, everyone of the children there i'm sure were very troubled like yourself very troubled yeah and so like i said it's it just doesn't help someone who's troubled to be put with dozens it's like the prisons no. again like we said it's the program in yeah. You've ended up in a horrific environment then. Um, where was this um, so, residential? So this residential school was in Bath Eastern, just outside Bath. From the outside, it looks amazing. It's a manor house, lots of ground, woodland around it. they got a skate park, all of that stuff. It looks great, or it looks great. But it was just decoration, man. Because the behaviour of the staff, you know, you had young staff, you had older staff, the women didn't behave well, the men didn't behave well. It was across the board. Yeah. Now, I speak to lots of guys now who I know from that, and they are traumatised beyond traumatised because of what happened at that school. Of course, as like I said, it was, it's, you've ended up getting into an even worse environment than what the home life was. Yeah. And that must have messed your mind up further. So any chance of doing well in secondary school and anything like this was obviously out the window. Yeah. And obviously I'm sure your ambitions were probably just to get out of that abusive environment. It was. Uh, and and trying to escape on a daily basis from drinking drugs. So did that increase during that period and crime and stuff like this? So through 14, 15, 16, whilst I stood at school, I am full on experimenting. You know, we're talking ecstasy, we're talking maybe a little bit of powder cocaine, we're, we're talking a lot of speed. I was done a lot of speed. But I wasn't, I, I was skirting on the edges of addiction, I would say. But I never thought I would end up in a situation. I just thought I was like everyone else, party drugs, doing party drugs, enjoying myself. And it was as soon as I left school and I was faced with a... Uh, 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 an option you either go home to your parents who don't at this point don't know who you are they they, they don't they you know you've got to think they've not seen me for seven years yeah the odd weekend here and there but they don't know who i am so i'm thinking oh, i'm going to get the smack down with all that crap if i go back there mm. or i find my own way in life now, a lot of people think when you come out of the care system, you're going to get given this flat. That's and, what I thought, yeah. Yeah, all of that. The, the, where we were, that wasn't the case. We literally finished school and we were left to do whatever. And it was literally that. I left school. I remember the day I left school, I went to Bristol. I, got, I went to Bath Town Centre, got on a bus, flew to Bristol, and then I was like, what am I doing? Where am I going? I'm 16 years old. So I was just floating around town. And I found uh, the, the homeless crew. You know, young, young kids like myself, but older people as well. And that's when I started really getting into crime and drugs. And because I've now, I'm not dealing with all of the stuff that's gone on for the past 16 years. I've just gone from one crazy cesspit of nastiness to being on the streets, being completely free to do what I want. No one can tell me anything. You know, and all these people, they were drinking a lot, they were doing a lot of drugs, you know, crime was rife. By this time, I'm breaking into cars, nicking car stereos, nicking the back shelves back in the day out of cars, you know what I mean? Anything I could do to make a graft. And I'm making this graft and I'm doing this, but I'm no fix the boat. And I keep getting arrested, I'm getting arrested, small arrests, nothing serious. These are all just small arrests. And I've got these small arrests and all of a sudden I'm in court and a judge is like, we're, we're going to end up sending you to prison, so we're going to put you in a hostel. You know, a bell hostel, everyone goes to a bell hostel. So I go to this bell hostel, the worst decision of my life, which is actually, it was the last bell hostel I went to, the first and last. So I've gone to this hostel, and it's just like a drug den, really. That's what it was, you know, and everyone's doing all sorts. And I come across a guy who I know through family, and he offers me a hit. 
So I take that hit, never, not really knowing. I'm just a messed up kid. Do you know what I mean? I, was, I ain't even hit 17 yet. So I have this hit and it just completely obliterates my mind. Do you know what I mean? Everything, all of that pent up anger that I had from this, this crap life that I perceived, you know, to be, um, it went away. So for, um, I don't know, a few weeks I'm hanging out with this guy and our crimes are progressing. And what was the drugs you were taking? Crack and heroin. So that's, uh, uh, that's what the hit was, was intravenous, yeah. yeah. IV, first time, never touched it before in my life. And now you've got a crazy 25 and, years ahead of you now. Yeah, and basically, goodbye your, your teens, goodbye your 20s, goodbye your 30s, goodbye pretty much most of your 40s. This is what we're doing to you now, mate. And I had it, and like I said, it just got rid of everything. And I ended up doing a street robbery. We, we, we've nicked a car from Gloucester, um, Gloucester Hospital. Uh, we're driving down, we see this guy sleeping, just sleeping in a lay-by. So he's got whacked round the heads. Um, we've taken his wallet and everything. It's this, I'm now out of control, completely out of control. So we've taken his wallet. Um, We've gone, driven a bit further. My mate's gone, oh, I do a burglary. We've done this fucking burglary. I don't go into burglaries. It wasn't my thing. I sat in a car on <laughs> on this one. He was off his head, cracked out, didn't know what was going on. you got to think, I'm still 16. Still 16 years old. And now all of a sudden I'm getting involved in street robberies and burglaries and oh, just crazy. Uh, end up getting arrested... Uh, got a two-year prison sentence. And which what what crime was this that you got sentenced for? For robbery. Then? So I got done for the accumulation of a load of them, or was it? No, it was so I was I was in the hostel for thefts off theft from motor vehicles. So I had all of those charges, but uh, we got caught for the robbery because my mate cut his hand and there was blood all over the car and it all led back. To, it was just stupid, we were idiot kids. So I end up in court. At okay. this point, you had a hard addiction, would you say? Um, you I e was definitely e using every, every day. day. Yeah. And how much at this point could you use in terms of crack? Obviously, heroin is not something that you can use hundreds and hundreds of crack times per day. Easy. Were you one of these people who... Easy, we would do three, four hundred pounds a day. Easy. And that's not me bigging it up for anyone. That's not me trying to big up my habit or anything. That's what we were doing. Because once you start smoking, you just want to smoke. Your pipes get bigger. Do you know what I mean? The hits get bigger, the snowballs get completely out of control, and that's why you end up smoking so much. You know, heroin's heroin. Like, the most you're going to spend on heroin really is about £100 a day. Anyone who's doing more than that, they're out of control and you're, you're risking killing yourself. So I was basically, that's what we were doing. I would say I had a habit of about £300 a day at that point. So I go to jail. I go to Portland. So did you be remanded prior to the court case? Or uh, you, no, I no. wasn't remanded. I was on bail. I was turning up to court. I was, where did they put, they put me somewhere in Somerset, in a hostel somewhere, because I went from the one in Gloucester to another one. Because they're trying not to send me to jail at this point, because I'm still a kid. Yeah. But we knew, you know, you know what's coming in the post. So I get the two years, I go to Portland Bill. Never been to anything like it before. It's a prison on top of a bloody island. And had a vicious reputation. A vicious it? reputation. Vicious. And I went in there just the wrong way. You know, I was trying to big myself up, trying to promote myself, saying I can get visits, all of this stuff. Literally got myself into serious trouble, almost got myself the biggest kick in. Like, fucking first prison sentence. You're just trying to find your habit. Just, right? Yes, yeah, I was literally anything to fund And at these times, yeah, this is like the older time price spice, was it flat out with heroin and crack in the heroin jail? Heroin and crack, that's what it was. You know, you get maybe a bit of puff or something, but back in that time, in the 90s, it was heroin and crack cocaine. That was what was coming into jail, that's what everyone was smoking, that's what everyone was hunting for. And thankfully I never saw the young offenders, but all my friends who went there said it's 10 times worse than 
the actual main adult prison in terms yeah. of violence, in terms of how often it can kick off for no reason, everyone's... Well, when it comes to violence, you know, you're talking young offenders, young kids with all of that testosterone still growing in them. You take the piss out of someone, look at someone the wrong way, like me getting debt, because I was all about getting in debt in jail. I was full of that, unfortunately, because I was an addict. And it would kick off, you know, you'd get dragged into cells, you'd fight in people wanting to force you to fight. That's the, that's my early experience of the prison system. And back then there was no electricity in the cells. You know, you had lights, you had the main light, but you had no plug sockets. If you wanted a stereo, it was batteries in yep. a stereo. And that was it. That was no TVs. This was hardcore uh, making bed packs and scrubbing your floor with a scrubbing brush and carbolic purple soap. It was real hardcore prison. But it was supposed to be a short, sharp shock. But for a lot of us... To the opposite turned you all into lunatics. It turned us into loonies, man. And um, in terms of talking about the debts and stuff like this, so you'd be... Sometimes you might have to take a slap there. Sometimes yeah. there might be ways of you obviously clearing the debts. Clearing so the like debt. you said... Yeah visits, yeah. um, so people don't know this is you going out to receive drugs yeah. on a visit, Yeah. and so obviously was it heroin and crack? Heroin and crack, I took some big parcels over the years, do you know what I mean, and a lot of it was for pennies of to cover my debt and have maybe a, a night smoke, and the risk is getting yeah. eight, ten years on your sentence. Okay, so, so when you talk about... Um, Big parcel, what sort of size are we talking? So we're talking an ounce and a half of gear, uh, you know, a big half ounce of crack maybe or, or uh, cocaine powder. Then on top of that, they want um, steroids in because a lot of the, the guys, they like to take their steroids. So these are big parcels. So, you know, you're, it's, if you're getting caught, you're getting caught. If you're getting strip search, yep. you're caught. And so would this be... Um... And so how much would you be getting paid on average? Would it be a case of clearing a couple hundred quid debt and then getting a, But people don't realise that couple hundred quid is probably only fucking half a gram or something yeah. like this. So it's like... Yeah, you know, it's an times worth? 10, isn't it? So yeah. I always say times 10 in prison. Yeah, so, what, so a couple of hundred quid, like you know, most probably 20 pounds yeah. street value. And so I would basically clear my debt and then get given a proportion, a portion, sorry, of the, of the parcel. But it was down to them, really. And these guys would take advantage of me because they knew, even though I'm a big guy, you know, I've always been this bloody big. But they knew I was an addict. Of course. And they oh, knew just, I will do whatever it takes. Just to, how it goes, unfortunately. Yeah. If not you, there's a fucking hundred other people who, yeah. are, who are volunteering to go and do it for yeah, less than you. Everyone's like to cut everyone in there for hits, for their visits, for everything. Yeah. Um, did you end up doing any hits or anything for people to clear debts even at that time in the Young Offenders? So, there's one particular moment I, I remember uh, the most, and we're going back to when we used to get the, the flasks, the metal flasks, before kettles in the cells. And this guy's, uh, I'm £100 in debt. And he said, this guy's come in from road, he's taking the piss, he he needs to get sorted. I will clear your hundred pound and put a hundred pound in your account. Now, to a man like me, who I never got people sending me money, and you got to think I'd never used to get letters. I didn't get visits. I I was that's generous for a prison. Yeah, fifties were Yeah, fifties. Yeah, yeah, fifties. Yeah, yeah, everyone's spice. begging to do it. <laughs> It's funny when you say that, yeah, 50s was So Yeah, he hooked but, you yeah, up. Yeah, he so. hooked me, the man hooked me up, and all I, I just went into the cell, in it. I said, this is from so-and-so, had the flask, whacked him, and I, I put some effort into it, do you know what I mean? Just whacked him around his head a couple of times. I'm not proud of these things, this isn't me bigging it up, I have to say this, because I ain't proud of it, this is just how I survived. This is what life's like in the yeah, jungle. This is what it is like, you know, there's, there's sheep, and, sheep and wolves in prison, do you know what I mean? You, you you need to sometimes you've got to become a wolf to oh. to get by being a little sheep and doing well, your things. Addictions turn you into the wolf, don't they? Unfortunately, unfortunately, and my addiction it didn't stop. That's why I say to people, I've had twenty seven years of addiction and twenty two years in prison. I say this, you know, I I uh, the maths says 
it couldn't have all been on on the road that I used to use as much when I was in jail as much as I could. Well, people go in there, the, the, the common misconception, obviously, when I went to jail, I said, I want anything to do with drugs. I want to stay completely away from drugs. I landed in there 48 hours late. I fucking need drugs more than ever yeah. in my life. We're fucking locked in a cell all day. So locked. if you thought you needed when you're outside running around and you've got the whole world as your playground, this what? is when you actually need them if you've got that sort of, as bad as it sounds, but that's what it is. People don't understand now, 90% uh, of prison is 24 hour banger. That's what it is, unless you get to a nice cushy jail and but you've got the a Z job. Even because they're understaffed. Yeah, they're understaffed. 24 hour bang up yeah, if you've not got a job, you'll you'll be on your door twenty three hours a day, and you know that's kind of thanks to the COVID pandemic. Yeah, but it's you know it's what it is, unfortunately, at the moment. So when you are stuck in your cell all day, maybe you got a TV, maybe you ain't got a TV, maybe you're on basic, but it's something to get you through your day. If you get high on spice or back in the day on the gear, right, that clears hours of your day. Me going man down, as they called it, on spice and waking up four hours late, that's four hours of jail I didn't have to do. Of course. And my prison life has been like that. It was full of as much drugs as I could get. Say there was 10 dealers on a wing. I'm scoring from every single one of those dealers at least once. But the issue is, I got no job. I got £2.50 on my canteen sheet. Well, how am I paying that? I don't care how I'm paying that because I'm an addict. So you cross that bridge with Yeah, I literally, you get your canteen sheet on Monday, you blag everyone so they don't get to see your sheet for whatever reason, you're just not about, right? So they don't get to see your sheet and then they come with lists. You put that down, Paul. Yeah, I've put that down. You put that down. Yeah, I've put that down. As we get towards the end of the week, my brain is doing so much. I am panicking so much. Because now I owe 10 people... Two or three of them might be idiots who've managed to get a bit of spice or they've managed to get hold of some drugs or something. But the rest of them, these are guys you do not mess with. They are going to come and fuck me up come Friday when I haven't got their canteen. For five pounds worth of canteen. Yeah, literally £2 five worth of canteen, pounds. And it's absolutely crazy in that yeah. environment. People are angry. People are, And they can't be mugged off. No. It's an environment where you can't get away. It's not like the outside no. world. And so back in that Portland, the YO thing, there must be... In, you end up must be getting in some situations, out of debts and stuff like this, and, yeah. and have taken a slap at certain points. Yeah, I, t I listen. I took beatings throughout, throughout in it, and Portland was my very first experience of that. Um, I said I'd take a visit for someone. I took a visit for someone else at the same time, sort of just, just blagging the guy in it because someone else had already offered me a better deal. So I've taken a visit, come back off visit, got my little bit of my parcel, just like to bang up. Walked into my cell, my man who I was supposed to take the visit for didn't even say anything, didn't give me a chance to explain. And this is the thing about prison, you can't give it the talk because these guys are fucking ruthless, they're, they're animals. Even YOs, they just don't care. I got put in the corner of the cell, I was in a ball getting the shit kicked out of me. And this isn't, I didn't owe him anything. Just he wanted a favour from me, they knew what I was doing, they knew I was taking visits for people. I did it for someone, you know, one of the, one of the boys rather than someone I didn't really know. And, yeah, I got served up. So, like I said, you've ended up going to Portland as a yeah. messed up addict who had been through a lot of trauma and abuse. And you've ended up getting super toughened and hardened yeah. during that period. Ended up serving 18 months, was it? Did you serve the full yeah. 18 months? No, I'd served, uh, I served 12 months. Yeah. 12 months. So, served 12 months there and you've come out a different man or yeah. child like sort of in between then you went in so you come out at 17 and a half just yeah. prior to 18 yeah. and you were now a hard lunatic yeah I was still homeless yeah. still uh, an addict because I'd been using pretty much throughout back then there wasn't a methadone script either Germany didn't offer scripts like that back then 
So I come out and I was literally... And then back to Bristol was this? Yeah, I went straight back to Bristol, straight back to St Paul's. And was this in... Because I've seen this bear pit, was that... Like, yeah, around right the bear pit, all around so there. So describe to us what the bear pit was. So the bear pit is a main hub from lots of subways from all different parts of Bristol City Centre. Uh, you know, there's benches, public toilets, and lots of people go there today, even today, it's still there, there's tents there, and a lot of the homeless hang about there, obviously they can sit in the subways and beg, that was always a thing, out of the way of police, because you're not allowed to drink in town, yeah. so it was a place they could all sit and drink, but it was, it's quite depressing, of course. you know, it's pretty much... The, all the people who haven't got anything in the world. And that's where I used to gravitate towards. And it's rife with drug trafficking. Rife with, not only, listen, you have all the dealers who used to pop around and all the wannabe dealers who are basically addicts who are just trying to sell enough to keep themselves going. So uh, all of that was going on around the bear pit. All through like the 90s, it was a real messed up place to be and yeah, a lot of a lot of sad things happen. A lot. I heard you talk about people dying in the like, real yeah. cold nights, and you wake up and people next to you might be yeah. dead and stuff like this. So. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's uh, going back to when, like, so you got the bear pit. Right next to the bear pit was a car park. So lots of people used to sleep in a car park. Sleep in a car park. It's a little bit warmer than sleeping out on the street. Okay, so you ain't got air coming through everywhere. That's why people used to sleep in car park stairwells. Uh, an old guy, he's like, you know, I don't know how old he was, he, can't, he was homeless, he looked 60 to me, but I was a teenager, and we'd all crashed out, all been smoking the night before, drinking, I woke up in the morning, I woke up, he didn't wake up, do you know what I mean? And I think I, I think that was my first experience of of death, seeing someone die. You know, I've seen lots of people OD, unfortunately, since then. We could, that was the life I was living. But at that point, I'd never seen anyone. I didn't realise you go asleep and you get too cold. Of course. That there's a possibility of not waking up. Maybe that was my first kind of kick into a reality that this life that I'm living wasn't for me. Course. But at that time, that was my only option. And so, like I said, at this time here, you had a you're a bit more toughened and hardened, having mm -hmm. been in Portland. And did your criminality, the seriousness of it, increase rather than breaking in cars? I know you did the Instant. wide robbery before, but it was yeah. So now it sort of stepped into street robberies and just ruthless. Yeah, absolutely instantly. I never went back to the stadium from cars after that. I was a street robber. I was someone who had a knife. A gun, imitation firearm, screwdriver, whatever it was. I was a weapons guy. I used to carry weapons with me. And my thing was to get money from people. And I'd become very ruthlessly efficient at that. And it was really bad because I'd go out and I'd do it and I didn't feel no way. Smoke the drugs. A week later, get caught for it. Because one thing I was was a terrible criminal. Was crap at it. It's absolutely crap. There's pretty much nothing I can talk to you about that I haven't, that I did, that I didn't get caught for. Yeah. That's why I'm able to be so open and honest about what I talk about, because I was a really crap criminal. Well, I don't think there's many successful criminals out there. No, <laughs> there's not. They'll tell you there are, they are, but they, there really isn't. So it was mainly street robberies. So that would uh, consist of it would consist of basically being like a night stalker, literally just walking around town, spotting someone alone at a cash point, alone walking home, uh, either sticking a knife in their back, like poking it, not stabbing them, yeah. sticking a knife in their back, sticking a gun in their back and saying, give me your money or I'm going to kill you. And that's what I did for... For years, for years, like up until 2003, I was kind of in and out doing that. And then in 2003... So, so you sort of managed to skirt away from any sort of serious... Serious. Things. But during that period, obviously, I'm sure your addiction had increased. Yeah, yeah. So you it's, went to prison for short... Yeah, I was, going, I was in and out a lot. Yeah. 
I was definitely in and out of jail a lot. I did a lot of remand time, but never actual. So the 22 years, I don't count the, the remand time that I did. And I, you know, I've done a few years of just remand. You sit there, you go to court. Oh, you've been in eight months. The, the, the offence that you, you were in was smaller than that. Off you go. And so this was all in sort of Bristol, was it? Bristol, at these times, yeah. All, all in Bristol. Yeah, all in Bristol. And at these times here was the Bristol, the Aggie crew were quite a big name on the streets, yeah. it pause, and then were they controlling the journal and stuff like this? They, were, the they were controlling the prison when I was in Bristol. They had complete control of the prison back then. And a lot of them were street dealers. So when I was around St Paul's, you know, a lot of the Aggie crew I'd known. But they were, to be fair, they were drug dealers I trusted. I trusted them. You know, you give them your money, you knew what you were getting from them. You know, half the people in St Paul's, like Black and White Calf, we can talk about going to the Black and White Calf in the, during the 90s, mate. And you just, it was crazy. It was like the Wild West of drug dealers. You know, there'd be a whole line of... So when the Black and White Calf was in its heyday, was that the place where you would go automatically to score? Would yeah. You, and where it's so many people there, would you be competitive with deals? Yeah, you competitive with deals. Like I was I was on all sorts of grafter. So I'd do anything for grafter. I'd go like uh, John Anthony and do a bit of shoplifting for designer clothes. Because right? I knew that was a good graft. I could take that straight to that's front line. Like, that's what I was going to say. Deal is uh, not that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Straight to front line with D&G jeans, whatever it is. And I go, listen, I got these. And they would go nuts, literally trying to grab them off of you. Cool. Right? And so like, giving you whatever. So, um, yeah, St. Paul's, Drummond Road. Like, uh, and how, like, how, how dangerous was it all back then? And that cause obviously had a vicious reputation, didn't it? There's a lot of yardies around, stuff like this, that come over and... Um, that was kind of, I've got to be honest, it was a really scary time to be to be an addict, definitely. But to be a drug dealer, you had to be crazy back then because you had the Bristol gangs, you had the Aggie crew, you had the independents. It's not like London where people can't go, you can't sell on this corner because you're not here. In Bristol, people used to just turn up and, you know, you weren't there yesterday, but you're selling there with everyone else today. So it was really dangerous. You know, there's a lots of shootings down there around those times. Stabbings weren't big back then, but shootings in Bristol really were. Lots of gang violence, you know, all of the prostitution. It, St Paul's was very, very bad at that point. Of course. So during that period, um, sort of between 1995 and 2003, 2004, did your crimes increase? Were you becoming more and more violent and ruthless? Um, was there any points where you tried to sell drugs or get sort of affiliated with the gangs? And obviously I'm sure that was not something that's going to... So I think, I, I ain't going to lie, I was a drug addict who thought my way out was to sell drugs. I had a friend, Simon, he's dead now, so I can talk about him quite openly. Uh, we had a little a little squat in St Paul's, and that was our thing for a little while. We'll buy it, we'll sell this much, we'll only smoke this much, everything's fine. We ended up getting beaten up, both of us, like, like, had our shit taken off us in the end. Because, yeah. like, like I said, it doesn't matter how big you are, it doesn't matter how gangster you think you are. If you've got something people in that life want, the, the, the majority of the time, people are going to take that off of you. And like I said, I had zero confidence in my life. I had, like, I've just been beat down my entire existence. So I was kind of used to giving in. So what happened is I become just next level out of order. Uh, I was introduced to firearms. And from there, I watched a movie, Menace to Society. I remember watching this movie, right? And it gave me that thing. And I remember getting... Getting this, uh, it was like a, uh, what was it? It was a Beretta. That's what it was. I know this for a fact. I've been doing something. Uh, we had this Beretta, and I literally thought, I was like John Wayne. I thought I was a gangster. I thought I could do whatever I want. Now no one is going to do anything to me ever again. Because that's what you believe. Like, you know. You, and how, how did you get the Beretta? So the story goes like this. I did a robbery of a pub, it doesn't exist anymore. And I've gone in there, emptied the till, took black bags of cigarettes, 
just black bags of cigarettes. Went to see a guy I knew. And this was a ruthless daytime, yeah, Robert. Went yeah, this night, is, no, this wasn't a nighttime. This was during the day. I went in this pub to go to the toilet, to be the fact, and like, I ended up robbing the place. So I got these cigarettes, taking it to my friend. They didn't have all the money that I wanted, but they had this firearm. Didn't, you know, it's, he, he wouldn't say it's something he would go out and do sh target practice with, but it would, you know, it's enough to scare someone if you need to scare them to death. So uh, I took the firearm, took a little bit of money, got went off, got my drugs, and I had this gun. Now, now I'm a real bad man. I'm a real gangster in my eyes. Do you know what I mean? I was just, it was completely out of control. And so from getting that gun, I went from doing normal street robberies, just tr scaring people, to pulling guns out on people doing street robberies then, home invasion robberies, yeah, and that's where it got really serious. My physical violence was never there. I never had the confidence for physical violence. I didn't have it. I, you know, I'm an addict. I just want money. Well, once you have a gun, you don't even need to. Yeah, you it, don't it, need it? to because of the fear, the psychology behind that fear. People tend to give you exactly what you want. I knew that. You know, I was never a stupid person. I was fully aware that I could use fear to get what I wanted rather than physically beating someone half to death to get what I wanted. I, of course. You know. so at this point here, you're firmly on the road of absolute madness. Yeah. Um, it's ruthless madness and on a path of destruction. Yeah. And so from when you got that gun then, how long a period did you have, would you say, when you were out from what, getting the gun? Obviously, it must six about months. Six months. Yeah. About six months. And it right. must have been an insane six months. It was insane. I was out every night. Yeah. Every, well, I say I was out every night. If I had a big race, if I had a big race, well, that might days. last me for a few days. Do you know what I mean? I don't need to go out. I could send other people out to go score. I used to get so paranoid smoking crack. I was fucking crazy, man. You wouldn't have liked to be in a room with me. I was really, really, really. I've had some friends like that, and if they're too drunk, I will not be around them. Yeah. like this because they've got knives in their hand, yeah. they're locking doors, they're yeah. following you to the toilet. Yeah, that's they me. They want to see you make phone calls, mm -hmm. and it's just completely. Who are you phoning, dudes? What are you phoning feds on me? You can't leave the place. It's just no. like. Yeah, and that was me. Like I said, it's when horrific. I talk about the madness of addiction, my addiction took me to places I wouldn't want to see my worst enemies at because I lost all normal thought processes. All I kept thinking is everyone's trying to take from me, everyone's trying to do what I'd already had done to me in the past. Don't trust anyone. And if they if they if they step over that mark, let them know what the consequences are gonna be. Yeah. So I you know, there was a lot of that for me and it did it literally went for like said, for about six months. So you I was probably did well to survive for six months yeah. out with a strap. Because obviously, I'm sure there's so many reports of the yeah. sort of stuff going yes. in at this point here. Yes. And so, how did it culminate? What ended up being the point where you end up getting caught for what crime was it? And was there like a bag of crimes they had already for you? And so, let's t talk about what the. So, uh, so I'm out doing street robberies with this gun. I've done a couple of home invasions at this point. Uh, so I decide to go Bristol Town Centre again go to a cash point, pull a gun out on this guy, give me your money. He's not having it. He shouted, I didn't realise, across the road were four or five of his mates. So now he's called me. I, I'm not going to try to shoot anyone. I'm not, you know, I'm just there to make some fucking money. No. So he's shouted, they've come, twisted me up, give me a little bit of an eye in. Can't blame them. Do you know what I mean? I just tried robbing their mate. So that's happened. I get to the police station. I'm being booked in now for firearm offences and attempted robbery. As I am being booked in at the police station, this other police officer makes a beeline for me. We're looking for someone like you. And obviously by that point, I've gone... My lips are sealed. I you know, I don't have any Cody's. There's no, <laughs> there's no one rescuing me. It was just me on my own. And I remember I've kind of lost the plot to the point where they had a police officer sat on a chair 
with the outside the cell door, with the cell door of open. Because they think I'm a lunatic. They think I've lost the plot. But I've been smoking crap constantly, man, for months. Going out doing crazy stuff. Come to the police station. I'm sat in, I'm sat in there having a half a conversation with his copper. Uh, CID just come in and like, we're further arresting you. Two more gun charges, uh, home invasion robberies, kidnap. It just, my whole life, my whole life just fell, fell through the floor. And that was 2003. So you got remanded got straight Got remanded, stra instant remand, yeah. Of course, Bristol. Bristol. Local. Yeah. And um, so what was the state of, did you plead guilty to the attempted robbery where it'd be at the cash point and then were you trying to fight, were you just trying to yeah, fight them all? I was trying to fight them all. As, as you yeah, One know, was banged to rights. Yeah, it, one was banged to rights, but I was at that point of, I'd already been to jail for robbery. I've already got violence on my record. I've got a solicitor who's saying, you're going to get life. This is what my solicitor's telling me. Or IPP or yeah, something. Yeah, or no IPP existed back then. It was, it was two, two uh, free strike life. Yeah. So you have free strike life or, or you had uh, mandatory life sentences or discretionary life sentence. So yeah. they were looking at a discretionary for me. So I'm like, I'm fighting this all the way. I'm fighting it all the way. I don't care. I don't care. Blah, blah, blah. Pleaded not guilty to everything. Now you got to think, I got caught with the firearm in my hand. Exactly. One of them was undeniable. Yeah, but... undeniable. But I'm like, no, no. Yeah, fuck it. Yeah, fuck it. It's, I hit that. Well, yeah. at that point, sometimes when you've absolutely fucked, you think, fuck it, what have I got to lose? Yeah. It's fuck it, innit? Yeah. Doesn't make too much difference, whatever way. I just thought, you're going who to prison gives, anyway. Who gives a fuck about the third off? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, you're going to prison anyway, so you might as well just run the risk, see what happens. Luckily, and I say luckily, I got ten and a half years. Yeah, so the offences you end up getting sentenced for then, so it was the attempted robbery there, then what, a kidnap so and it was, home invasion. It was attempted robbery, possession of firearms there, then it was kidnap, false imprisonment, because I took someone from one place to another place. And then when I got to that place, there was other people there. Yeah. So that's where kidnap and false imprisonment are two different charges. But this was an armed one This was well. an armed yeah. as well. So more firearms. Uh, yeah. I think I ended up with 10 offences. And they were all what they call indictable offences. So it's either firearms, kidnap, false prison or robbery. That was what they were. And... I ended up, it worked out, I got about a year per charge. Yeah. Now, when you think of it like that, yeah, you got a touch. I got a touch. Yes, my age was a huge factor in that. It's a huge factor. So at this point here, you're only 19, 20 years old? I was 22. Oh, yeah, by the time you'd be yeah, a year yeah, on 23, remand. sorry. Yeah, a year on remand. So, yeah, yeah fuck yeah. it, I'm still really young. Still though. young. Still young, considering all they know about me is I've been in and out of the court system. For as far back as they can remember, I've never had anyone coming into the courts with me. I've never had that support. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And how long was the trial then? It must be a fast school, because like I said, obviously you were banged yeah, to rights. It so. was four days, like a four day trial. It, well, it didn't even last four days, I don't course. think. Do you know what I mean? It was pretty straightforward. Yeah. They had, the most they had was just some guys doing facial uh, mapping and. Uh, clothes mapping, so I had I wore clothes with certain symbols on because of my size. They could then go, well, this ninety eight point nine nine percent that it's this person. So yeah, uh, it didn't go well. No, it's a four day trial. Found guilty. Did you get sentenced on that same day, or did you come back a couple? No, of I called later? the judge a pussy because he wouldn't sentence me. Darwell Smith, I remember, gone to court, obviously. Trial, think, boom, last day of the trial, get sentenced, get it dealt with. And then he said, right, we're we're uh we're adjourning it for for reports. And I'm like, what's the point of reports, mate? You've just found me guilty of kidnap, armed robbery, and false imprisonment and firearms. No report in the world is gonna make a difference in what so I called him a pussy. I thought you're a fucking pussy. Worst mistake of your life. Of course, he's got a sentence. He's got not. like you know a couple of weeks later. I got to go back to court yeah, and take him also on. Yeah, you've got a touch then because he's really done that to him a fucking couple of weeks before. 
Oh, when I went back for sentencing, he said that. He's, I remember it. I remember it like it was yesterday. You've got to think this was like 2004 when I got sentenced. He said after he's read out all the tens and all the fours and all of that, and he basically let me know I'm getting ten and a half years, he was like, just so you know, I chose this sentence because it's not too long, so you can't appeal it, but it's not too short, so you're not going to forget it. <laughs> That's what he said. That is a, a crane court judge letting me know that I'd really upset him. But I could have easily got, easily, easily got a life sentence. Without a doubt, look, oh, it's, it's simple. The amount of charges. The amount of armed robbery to yeah, get 10 and a half years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's complete touch, complete touch. And through that, I served, I ended up serving just under nine years. I yeah. should have served about seven. But I was an addict. What category were you initially when you first I was sentence? a category B to start with because anyone who gets over a 10 year stretch, they go to cat B. That's one of the, that's just one of the things you are. You're a standard cat B prisoner. So I went off to Loudon Grange up north. You know, my mental health was all over the place. My drug use was all over the place. So you've maintained your habit through the yeah, never bumps yeah, in Bristol? Yeah, ma maintained it through, through, throughout uh, my romance. Like, I had drug dealers from Bristol who were basically looking after me because they all thought I was getting a life sentence. Of course. And that's what prison used to be like. People used to look after people who they thought were never going to see the cold light of day again. Or that they can use. Yeah, all that they can use. Of course. <laughs> And so, like I said, obviously after getting the ten and a half years, you're absolute. Yeah. Your head's all over the place. Yeah. Ten and a half years feels like a lifetime. You can't see the end. No. There's, there's been sent to Loughton Grange, which is up north. Up whereabouts? north. Yeah. So it is. It's Nottingham. 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 And so that was a obviously being taken out of Bristol. You're local, and that being chucked in there, I'm sure it was a rough, horrible. Yeah. You know, Kenny Noy. Kenny Noy was out at the time, so, yeah. so it was, you know there was some proper danks as well. Heavy people. Proper, some heavy big people. And I not learnt my prison lesson at this point either. So I was using quite a lot, telling people that don't worry, my peeps have got me. Do me this till the end of the week. So I was really like. I was getting in quite a lot of debt, you know. It was still heroin at this time. It was still heroin. A little bit of crap, but mainly heroin because that's the habit. Well. Yeah, that's the habit. You, you run whilst you're in prison. And I ended up having to do the great escape from that jail because I was going to get killed. But uh, There was no two ways about it. If I didn't get out of that jail, I would have got murdered because I just got in debt to some big guys. But, and you don't think about it. And that's the thing with people that don't understand jail. Uh, I was an addict. I was a junkie, a crackhead, call it what you will, sat in, sat in the system with, as far as I could see, no release date, because it was just so far in the future. The only thing I wanted to do was get high, and I was a grand manipulator. I could tell them what they wanted to hear. I could... Pretend to be speak on the phone when I wasn't actually speaking to people. I do that in a cell full of like gangsters. Do you know what I mean? And like, all right, babes, yeah, if you sent that money, yeah, sweet, thank you. And, do you know what I mean? And make sure I, I, I don't care. Just give me, <laughs> just give me my drugs, and that's what I was like. So. I ended up having to go run into the screws uh, on this occasion. I was like, listen, I've got myself into a real sticky situation. Uh, I need block. I need block. If you don't put me to the block, I think tomorrow when you open the cell, I'm a fucking dead man. So they put me in Langdon Green seg. Like, not on, like, a Rule 45 or anything like that. They wouldn't do that for me. They no, I, 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 I think it was something to do with my offending and the way I was that they knew if they ever ruled me off, I'd end up causing chaos. They they did a lot of the time was they'd block me and keep me down a block until they could transfer me. So I did that from Loudoun. Ended up going from Loudoun to... I ended up in Dar uh, Parkhurst eventually. There was, there was a stop off. I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, remember Woodhill. You said. Yeah, Woodhill. Thank you. You've done your research. Yeah. So yeah, we we did that, and I ended up in Parkhurst. And 
It's meant to be a rough journey, isn't it? It was at that time, it was really rough. This is how rough it is. You, I landed there, people came to my door, like, where's your paperwork, mate? Yeah, yeah, like one of these Americans, yeah. they want to check who you they are. They want to you're... check who you are. Yeah, yeah, fuck that. And I was lucky, there was other Bristolians there. It was like, listen, like, like, this is fucking Simo, mate. Yeah. The guy's doing big fucking bird lowing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Not realising, really, I've just pulled a fucking nasty, sneaky, been quite... Of course, but that's what happens but, around the world. And this is why I, I come today, innit? Because I want people to understand, gel isn't all having raves in your cell. It's not what you're seeing on TV. Prison, for a lot of addicts, is hard. It's brutal. It's about trying to survive. If you've not got nothing, you're trying to create something from nothing. And yeah, I ended up in them situations more and more than one occasion. Getting in debt, the drugs, the addiction, doing whatever you needed to, whether it be visits and the hits and stuff yeah. like this, is just carried on. It's just a yeah. never ending sort of cycle. Um, get Sometimes moves, some different jails went round, obviously it's big tour. It was, yeah. So I, I, I ended up in Parkus, and Parkus was where I got into the most trouble, really, because at that time there was cooking facilities in the jail. So everyone had a hot oil and lots of very nasty things. And I saw some real nasty stuff. And I got to a situation like, you know, a few months in, I got to, the debt had got to a point where people start talking about you on the wing. So you, you kind of handle in the situation until other people realise you owe them money as well. Of course. So then it was the same situation. I just refused to bang up refused to back up in Parkers because I knew someone had threatened to do me with hot oil. Someone threatened, she'd be like, that's not a threat I, I was going to ever take lightly. So I just refused to bang up. I'm like, man, I ain't banging up. Say what you will. And that's another way of just getting yourself down the block. Of course. Uh, it's just the easiest, quickest way to do it. And so during this sort of period, like I said, there's times where you might have done a hits hat people. Yeah. And there might be times where you couldn't escape stuff. There was the times where you obviously got a slap or when you've got to do yeah. hits and end up getting hurt and stuff like this was there any occasion where you end up getting hurt during these well, periods, few years to be fair uh, like I said I was a chief manipulator uh, and I really was so I would tell people whatever I needed to tell them just to, to allow it I've had to go to people now this is a story to tell. I've had to go to a guy selling Parker's once and he sat in his cell I'm like dude I need to talk to you I owed him about 80 quid you know, it's time to pay the piper. But I knew if I could just calm him for a minute, I'd at least get another week out of this out of this deal. So I've gone to the cell, put my foot right by, right by the door. Like I'm at his door. I said, bro, I've got to talk to you about something. He said, what do you want, man? I've gone, bruv, you know, I ain't got that money for you. He's come running towards the door. I've just slammed his door <laughs> shut. Kept the f and I'm saying, dude, I am not opening this fucking door until you calm down. Please calm the fuck down. I said, you're going to get your money. You're done. You know, I'm literally trying not to scream. I'm like, you're going to get your money. You're going to get your money. You just need to calm down. And I used to be able to do that because people would then go, Fair play to you, mate. You've got some balls on you. Do you know what I mean? Everyone else would have run off. Here you are. Old that. Of course. Do you know what I mean? So then I've quashed the debt for a week, but then I'm being given more rope to, to, uh, to hang myself with. And the, the prison environment is drug dealers want to be drug dealers. They want to sell drugs. They don't want to keep hold of their drugs. They want to be the man. They want to be the boy who's sorting you out. They want to be the one who's got the 10-10, the bang-bang, all of that. So I would play into that. So I didn't really get hurt much in my prison life up until towards the end. Towards the end, I got steel plates in my and was face. Was that the last sentence you done? Or was that oh, it was the last it? sentence. It yeah, was. Sorry. It wasn't my last prison experience, but it was my last. Cause my last yeah. sentence was an EPP, so yeah. it went on for nine and a half years. Of course. And so, like I said, you've done the Parkhurst. You've done yeah. the. Bristol, you went end up doing a tour. You end up eventually in Dartmoor on Dartmoor, that sentence. Yeah. And you ended up spending four years there, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I did. Which is yeah. obviously you must have been behaving to a degree to be able yep. to stay there four years. So did you slightly become a little bit more sensible in the way you're doing things at this point? Here, you've been in jail for a few years. Yeah. 
And at a certain point, did you start trying to do education? You were trying to do a degree? So, work, yeah? I, I, Dartmoor was really the turning point for my prison story. And I was, you know, um, I'd done all the education courses, you know, the level one, two, English, mass customer services, catering, hospital. I'd done all of those courses and they come to me and were like, um, we're looking for some people to do higher education because it makes the prison look good. So I was like, sweet. They put me through an access course. I smashed that, got really high grades on that. And then they were like, right, what open university uh, course would you be interested in doing? And I went for, I chose health and social care. It's something I've always been passionate about, you know. It's, it's quite interesting. I may not have seemed like the sort of person to be interested in that, but I kind of use it every day now. So I started studying in Dartmoor. I did four of my six years for my uni degree. I did in Dartmoor, and they were a huge, huge help. Uh, prison education trusts were a massive, massive help. And through doing, starting to study, I started to understand that I wanted to get clean. I started to understand that this life that I was living, it just wasn't getting me anywhere. It was just, I was literally on a fucking wheel going around and around. And by this point, you know, Dartmoor, so I would have served, what, 16 years or something, you know what I mean, in and out of that time. Not served, but I've been in and out like 16 years by that time. It was getting completely out of control. So I did the 12 step program, which is, you know, drug rehabilitation. It's very hardcore. It's not something I follow now, but it put me on the, the road really to recovery and understanding that there are certain things I need to change in my life of that I can actually get better and stop. Stop the madness. Yeah, so did you manage to get clean then through the 12 step programming? You'd never managed to get fully clean. So no, you, no. Had you reduced your using, you weren't doing madness, you weren't. As far as the prison's concerned, I was completely clean. Yeah. My drug tests were clean. Yeah. You know, so, and I was playing the game, but I was, I was using. That's the crazy thing with the heroin. It stays in your system for such a short yeah. period of time. It's yeah. Like, that's why the. So when you're getting drug, drug tested, tested once a that, month, right? Yeah. When you're getting drug tested once a month, and you're trying to stay clean, but you still like to have a little party, as people used to call it, uh, you can do that. Well, once you've had your drug test, you know for yeah, a couple of you weeks. Know, you you know you're right for three weeks. Literally, you know you're right for three weeks. You can smoke for three weeks, and then you need to leave it alone. For but in terms weeks. of, obviously, you reduced your taking a lot, and you weren't yeah. having to do madnesses within the journal, or do it. you weren't yeah. getting yourself in such situations no. at that point. And, um, and so you got through your degree as well. Yeah. Like, and then so eventually did you get you got to a decat, didn't you? Yeah, from... I ended up going to HMP Lay Hill. I was pretty much clean at that point. And where's Lay Hill? I've never heard so of it. it's in uh Gloucestershire. So that's fairly local for you. Yeah, it's quite it's, it's a local jail, it's, you know. I I actually got visits there and stuff from friends, which is quite nice. And so th by this point here, your mindset when you've ended up going to the decat, obviously you've been doing a degree, you've been doing some sort of study and trying to reduce your taking. Had you started thinking about possibilities, obviously, when you're out, trying not to do crime and maybe trying to do something legit? And I thought, coming to the end of that ten and a half year sentence, I thought I was fixed. I was trying to be drug free. I was uh, getting myself in all sorts of education. I was actually in Lay Hill. I was teaching people to read and write using the uh, toe by toe method that they use in jail. I think it's called uh, Julian. Uh, no, it's not Challenge Trust now, but it used to be called toe by toe. So I was doing a lot of positive things, and it was all going really, really well. Uh, and in the end of two thousand and ten. I got out. But while you were in the decat, or oh, had, yes. had your drug taken increased like massively? Because obviously, you used to talk about the t times ten pros yeah. in decat, they're pretty close to street pros. So uh, I, I had a real issue in decat. I was there most probably two weeks before the heroin use kicked up again. Because, like you've just alluded to, it was basically street prices. And not only was it basically street prices, most of the people that were going out to work were going to work in Bristol. And I had all sorts of connections there. I had people picking up fucking a few bags every time they went out, picking up half ounce of pollen or a bit of weed, whatever it was. So I had that 
coming in for myself for once. Uh, it just got out of control. I was smoking fucking... I was just smoking weed and lead on my bed in the fucking DCAT prison thinking I was on holiday camp. I always said to people, well, DCAT was a break between CCATs. That's all I ever used to say because I knew. I knew what the eventuality was of being in a Cat D. And I was in that Lay Hill for not too long, really. Ended up smoking. The debt reappeared again. I'm sat in Lay Hill on, on the grass in the evening. It's getting dark. Get all the bad thoughts come into my head. How am I going to pay this? How am I going to pay this? I have this person, that person on this wing. I have that person on this wing. It all got too much, so I just absconded. Is just it, yeah, 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 I just got up. Literally went straight across the field, two fields, and you're, you're on roads. Now, for people who don't know, open jail is open. Yeah. There are no fences. There are no walls. There's no razor wire. It's usually an old military base turned into a prison. And so I ended up absconding. I didn't abscond for very long. I was, I was gone for like two days. And what, they catch up? Uh, Give yourself no, in. I handed myself in. Scored. Got what I needed, handed myself in to Stapleton Road Police Station in Bristol. I was like, mate, I absconded from Lale two days ago. Hi. Because I didn't want extra bird. I didn't, that isn't what I want. I just didn't want to be in debt. I didn't want to be in that situation. It's madness, isn't it? The whole yeah. thing's a fucking madness. But, yeah. And they know this, the, the prison system know this is happening. They actually, they see it forming. They see people getting in debt. They see this stuff. And it's there's it's well, either they can't stop it or there's no way of stopping it because it's like they don't want to upset. They can't stop it, either, but they, yeah, they can't upset the whole routine and yeah. everything how it works. And that's like I said, the prisoners control the prison rather than prison officers, and it's a madness. I have been saying that for a whole leap of time. Mm. So you've ended up getting sent back to CCAT then just to finish off your last few yes. months of that. And this was in 2010. Did you yeah, say? 2010. Yeah. 2010. Did you manage to sort of like get grip of your the addiction when you went back to those few mums or you end up with a parcel? Uh, no, I ended up, I, I had a little bit of a parcel but that never lasts long, do you know what I mean? A bit of canteen here, a bit of that and, then, and that soon went. Um, but I did, I got out clean. I got out clean. I think I got retoxed. So, which is basically if you've been clean from opiates for a certain amount of time but you're a life addict like I would be classed as, they will offer you a script Yep. to go out onto the street with because if you know for fear that you go out have a hit day one and od so retoxification is something they offer not all prisons offer it yeah but a lot of prisons now offer so i was retoxed and then where was this in the streets of bristol and now they because now i'm i'm a serious offender now so I don't get released homeless anymore yeah so what is it mappers like mapper yeah. oh so i was mapper level two yeah and so that means I ended up in, hostel. in a hostel in Weymouth. Oh, bastards in there. Oh, oh. So I ended up in a high-risk hostel, so for serious violent offenders. So that's across the board of violence, from robbers to sex offenders. And you, you're all mixed in, and it all gets very... Oh, yeah, it wasn't great. So I stayed down there for a bit. I maintained my sobriety. I stayed clean. It was all good. Met a couple of girls. Enjoyed myself. All of that. Got two girls pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> got two Congrats. girls pregnant at the same time. It got messy in my head. And I went back to addiction. I just went back to and this it. was why you were still in the hostel? Or uh, just left? after. Yeah, I and just left you, the hostel. Where did you go? Did you stay in Weymouth there? Or no. I went back, I went to Wiltshire, not far, I went to a place, Trowbridge, it's just down the road from here, uh, met a girl, moved in with her. Get her pregnant as well? Uh, no, I didn't, <laughs> but it was, it was messy, and you got to think, I'm with one girl, and I've got these two previous girls that I knew, phoning me up, going, mate, I'm pregnant, mate, I'm pregnant, I've just come out of a 10 year, 10 and a half year stretch, I'm just trying to deal with 
addiction, trying to get into this new relationship, it all just went nuts for me. And I went back to the Yeezy, which was heroin and crack. I went back to smoking that again. And crime, obviously. And crime. crime. And so what was it initially? Ended up, ended up getting um, getting into street robberies, because that's what I knew. And this was in Wiltshire, basically? In Wiltshire, Wiltshire yeah, in Wiltshire. And I ended up uh, robbing a guy for a couple of mobile phones. Uh, slashed him across his stomach. Could have been a lot worse than it was. He had four layers of clothing on. Yeah. If he didn't, you know, it could have opened him up. It could have really opened him up. And I don't know why. I'm thankful now to this day, but the the courts give me a blight. They gave me a result. I could have got IPP and it gave me EPP, extended license rather than indefinite sentence of course and what year was this so this was just trying to work out how long you yeah. were so you got released in 2010 went down to Two. Weymouth you were there oh, I was like 18 months okay so 2012 fucking hell 2012 yeah 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 18 months so I yeah. was out yeah so yeah. after a 10 and a half on the old systems and what what you, and obviously you had your license as well so 2012 yeah. you got an EPP but how many years EPP so I got so what I got I got a five year three month with a four-year extension. Yeah. So they class it as a nine and a half. It's on my lights, it's on my criminal record as a nine and a half, but it's not a nine and a half year sentence. Yeah. It's nine and a half years. So I I served I served three and a half years. Um I was doing really well to be fair. Trying to sort yourself out. Yeah, trying out to sort myself was out. Jones, because, was it local jails or was it back um, in the... uh, yeah I went from Bristol, it was pretty local to be fair. Bristol, Dartmoor, Guy's Marsh, Earlstoke. I think they are the ones I finished up in Earlstoke. So you're doing like little hustles to survive, yeah, them, rather than doing hits, for rather people, than doing it? hits, yeah. That's and it was spice. This is spice day. Got into the spice era, which I was yeah. madness. And it was crazy. Like I first come across it, synthetic cannabis. That's what I thought it was. Oh, yeah, I'll have a bit of weed, mate. Smoked it, the green stuff, yeah. the actual, the the actual, uh, the 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 leaf, and yeah, it used to knock me out, and I used to project all of it. And it's, it's funny, I heard you talking about it on another podcast I listened to last night. Mm -hmm. You're talking about how this shit makes you trippy, and it really yes. does. And so, like the first time I've got in there, someone's gone to me, "Oh, do you want to join?" Fucking rolled up some of this shit, I smoked it, and my brain was going crazy. Yeah. My eyes, it's like tripping. Yeah, you are on and a trip. Nothing like smoking a fucking no. joint. No. But nothing. obviously, in an environment like that, you just want a little escape. Mm. And the fucked up thing is that you can smoke this stuff, go a million miles away, but then half hour later, you feel sober, stone yeah, cold. Completely and sober again. Completely different sober. Different from weed, which is like slowly yeah. access, but this is stone cold, and you need to. Like, yeah, it's like uh, they call it prison crack. Yeah, but fucking it literally is, it? Yeah. prison crack because that's what it's like. Anyone knows the uh, anyone been around someone who smokes crack? You know they want they've had one, yeah. they want another one straight away, and that is the same thing. This spice can put you out. It can knock you out. You can wake up. I woke up in a cell full of vomit, completely cell full of vomit, and first thing I went for. Was my spice paper? Yep. So I like, haven't to load up again, and you just think that's crazy. In terms of um, comparing it, obviously, to the heroin and crack, mm. did, was it like worse for the prisons and stuff? The like the, the heroin and crack, more people going over, more addictive, more, more fuck people up. More people use it. It's more acceptable to use. Even the the big men. Or the gel, yeah, as it, they it, call it, themselves. It's changed slightly now from what I'm hearing from people who are coming out now. Like so, but back then in. 2012, 2013, yeah. 2014, everyone was working it. Everyone, everyone, because it was classed as And it was the green cannabis. stuff, so where it wasn't the paper like what it is now, it was a lot more acceptable. Oh, it looks joint, it's yeah. the same sort of thing. and Because like, you had tobacco in gels, legal tobacco back then, all of that, it was all cushy, it was all easy. But uh, then obviously the, the paper come along and stuff, and it, it really did sort of... I was a real victim of spice. I would definitely class myself as a victim of spice. I was easily drawn into it. I would hunt it all day. I would make sure I'd always had something to bang up with, always, no matter if that means hustling yep. or robbing someone for it. I'm banging up with spice at the end of the day. So it really messed up my recovery journey when the spice hit. 
because I'm trying to get off of these big two, the heroin and crack that's been plaguing my life. A whole since, new, new yeah. problem. Now, and then I've got this brand new problem. And I'll be honest, it was pretty much up until I, I finished prison that I was flirting with Spice, having the old pipe because it, they soak it in, like as you all know, they soak it, it's a chemical that like they just soak paper and it comes into the gel. So you just have the old pipe now and then, do you know what I mean? Because I just want to feel a buzz or something. So, so, I, so it's an escape from those, yeah. that cell. And so like I said, you end up in 2012 going in there, getting the five years of EPP. Yeah. And with the four year extended, which is yeah. not, and so you, how long of that sentence did you end up serving then? I um, mean, this through this a spy sentence, seven years, seven years, so you end up getting years. released around yeah. 2019. And was that when did COVID start? COVID, I was in for COVID. I got out, I was, I did a year of isolation. I, ha I have no spleen, so I did a whole year banged up. I, you know, we talk about we talk about behind the door. Uh, that was uh, yeah, that was that was crazy. So. Isolation sends you crazy, like you yeah. say as well. Fuck mm. me, I did a couple of weeks in the block. I'm fucking yeah. went too loudly from there. I did a whole year. It was a year almost to the to the day. For when COVID hit, I was getting these letters from fucking Downing Street going, "Listen, you're severely, uh, extremely Don't vulnerable. You. you can't be around other prisoners." And so, and you know, during this period, um, the COVID times, was mm. it uh, were the drugs still free flowing into the? No, no. So that was probably did you a favour in certain did ways. Me a massive favour. I was basically a year clean, you know, and I add that onto my clean time today because cool. that's how you know I'm very proud of that. Most of people don't be. understand in jail. It's hard to go a year without doing anything if you're an addict. Yeah, like I said, it's if you think that it's going to be easier to get off the drugs in there, it's much harder to get yes. off the drugs in there because they're around you when you know they're in the same room or same yeah. building, the same house. It's like it's like having it's like only going to score in a block of flats. That's all you ever have to go. You live in that block of flats, and you don't need to search more than that block. That's what being in prison is like because yeah. you've got dealers every. 10 cells yeah, so or there's 25 something. dealers on the wing. Yeah, it's crazy. You got no, go see so-and-so. You got no, go see so-and-so. And people don't understand that. And for people like me, it was really, really hard in that. I struggled a heck of a lot of the time. You know, I don't ask anyone for sympathy. I put myself in there. I committed those crimes. I deserved every single day of the 22 years I served. I did, I deserved it, yeah. absolutely. Some people have to go through it, but like yeah. I said, fair play to you, because I see a lot of people, even to get off it for those 12 months in there, because you can still find it, even if it's more difficult yeah. than theirs, it's always there. And I see a lot of people come out and obviously can't get off the spice when they get out, yeah. there, and it's fucking... I know, I, it's, I, it's I know. And then when you're getting the spice out here, at the prices that is out here that people just turn into and people. that's the thing it's that's when i heard about the prices of outside spice i got scared because i'm thinking i don't i no i don't need to be getting access to that yeah, yeah kill yourself because i would have killed myself i would have ended up definitely overdosing on spice choking on my own vomit and dying you know i was in a jail where two guys died the same night yeah. Same night, different wings, same night, smoking the spice. And it didn't stop anyone smoking the next day, did it? Dude, it not only did it not stop people smoking, it encouraged people to smoke because they knew it was strong as fuck. It's this, like what it's, I said, it's horrific. So, like, it's I the Leah Betts thing. thing yeah, you see three people, I see three people go over of this one that the sweet leaf that got named the man down this before the man down this where it yeah. all come from the next day all people wanted was the sweet leaf yeah no one else had any market unless you had the man down no. it's like fucking that's hell, what crazy is, it's the insanity isn't it it's, that is the insanity of addiction though yeah absolutely nuts and so like i said you've ended up getting released then in 2019 2019 right? yeah been clean for a year yeah released to where where did you go to the straight, straight um hostel i went to a hostel straight away to Gloucester, right across street, the first hostel I went to, that's why I ended up going back to. Yeah. The last prison I went to yeah. was the first prison I went to as well. So, which is always bizarre. It's like it was of tying it off for me. And obviously the hostels are horrific. 
They're the there worst was, place. There was a kilo of cocaine in the hostel I was in. Yeah, fucking hell. Did a guy you... was washing up kilos. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I'm like, mate, what, what the fuck? And so what, did you end up relapsing then? Uh, no, I didn't relapse. I just made it very clear to probation what was going on. I'm like, you can't actually keep me. You can't expect me to be here. Set up so, to fail. Yeah, I was being set up to fail. So they did the right thing and let me move back home to Swindon with my partner, where I've been ever since, ever since. And so talk to me about the last four years then. Um, obviously, you've stayed out of trouble now. Congratulations from Thank that. You've you turned your life around. You're even trying to help people now, which yep. is sort of the best way to keep ourselves on track, isn't it? At the same time as doing positive stuff and yeah. back, giving back to the world. And so talk to me about your journey then over the last four years. Um, what you have to do. So after 2019, uh, when I come home, uh, I finally realised I was on to something, getting myself clean the way I was getting myself clean. Um, I started the, the social media journey, let's call it. It was like a recovery diary of such. That's all it was meant to be. Uh, I started doing TikTok, Facebook, you know, all, all basically all the apps. I'm Paul Addict Mentor on all of the apps. All the apps. links will be below, guys, in the description, so add them up on everything. Thank you very much. And so I started putting videos out. And these videos, they just really started to blow up. They don't get huge views, right? I'm not talking millions of views here, but the support I get back has just really pushed me on. I've started doing, I work with Bristol Rovers Community Trust because I'm a Bristol Rovers fan. Uh, started doing talks with them. From there on, I started talking with the MP around here, so Robert Buckland, started pushing my message out there. Um, early on, um, I've obviously done a couple of these now, and I wrote my own recovery manual called uh, the Non-Active Approach. It's, yeah, it's mine, it's my baby, it's something that I'm really proud of. I've got like five rules to recovery that I just think are very simple. You know, you've got the 12 steps, you've got five guidelines from, from me, like be honest, ask for help, change people, places and things. Uh, self care. <laughs> I always forgot self care and stick to stick to the guidelines. Right, simple. And from that idea, I've written a complete um, recovery manual, which I give away for free. I don't yeah, ask you. people or anything. Links below. It's so. on. Yeah, the link will be below on that. Um, it's completely free to everyone, and I've really been loving it. And it's obviously proven to work. Yeah, and yes, it does work. Them. Not just for me, either. people that have used it. Yeah, since. people that actually. Well, the reason that people obviously you get your audience and you be able to captivate it is because people relate to you and obviously they trust in you now. Yeah, and so that's obviously really cathartic. Helps you at the same time. Yeah. to help people helps you at the same and help. It's just a win-win all it, round. It really is a win-win all round, and the support I get across the board is absolutely crazy it, it, it genuinely is absolutely crazy i've uh, just recorded my first tv show like uh can't tell you what it's called yet obviously yeah. but that's going to be out early next year been filming my documentary a film student reached out to me said do you want to make a documentary we've been doing that looks like fingers crossed we're going to get that commissioned so and that'll all help me doing what I'm doing. You know, I'm now going to take, I take my family on holiday. It's brilliant. All of these things have all happened because I was able to get clean. And now I'm doing talks in schools. Um, I've got schools in Bristol, Gloucester, Bradford and Avon and Swindon all locked in just to listen to me about my, mis my message, about promoting anti-knife crime, anti-county lines. Like, we talk about county lines like it's a new thing. It's not a new thing, everyone. County lines has been going as long as I've been around. It's just now got a name. Yeah, that's, it's just been, yeah, yeah. And then trying to market it as a political tool now. And it it's whatever, really is. Whatever, that's, all, that's the only reason you see it in the media. Yeah. Forget it, it's just drugs and hard drugs and that no. is it. It's addiction and dealing and prison and suffering and trauma. That's all. If you want your kids to know about county lines, Dean, you want to let your kids know about the real impact, don't rely on PCSOs. Don't rely on MPs. Rely on people like me. You know what I'm talking about. 
I go out and the feedback I get after I do my talks is just next level. I get kids coming back to me, I get parents coming back to me. And this is all about giving back after taking so much. And I took so much on the system. I can't even imagine how much it cost to house me for those 22 years. I think it's about 60 grand a year. Yeah, it's more so for troublesome prisoners yeah. as well. So. Yeah, yeah, especially me. I was getting transferred all over yeah, the spot. Yeah, you were high risk. I think yeah. you can get over 100 grand a year for high risk yeah. uh, prisoners. So. so, you know, I, that's, so that's why now I'm trying to do whatever I can to promote that positive message. I'm not a gangster. I'm not an ex-gangster. I'm an ex-prisoner. I'm a recovering addict who just wants to show people that, you know, you can really turn your life around. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll fully take my hat off to you. And forget trying to help the system. It's all about trying to help the individuals yeah. on a similar path to yourself. And that's like the most important thing. Who cares yeah. about the government and how much money they no. spent and all this? The system's yeah. broke anyway. It is. So it's because the system's broke that you end up standing it for 22 yeah. years rather than a couple of years. Yeah. But like I said, the best thing that you're doing is helping people, and like I said, who are on that path. Yeah. And I fully take my hat off to you. And fully take my hat off to you for changing your life as well, um, from being on that revolving door doing two massive sentences, yeah. being for addiction all those years, and it's so difficult to, difficult to get off. Like I said, I've seen lots of my friends who have been through numerous rehabs and they can't get off for love nor money for their kids, no. for their partners, for their parents. Yeah, it's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. And not everyone escapes addiction. And people need to like, understand that it's like, there's nothing glamorous about addiction. It might be the first couple of weeks, but there's nothing glamorous. There's nothing good. The people who are addicts don't want to be addicts. There's no. nothing great about it. This is a really illness and stuff like we this. We choose the first one. That's it, though. We only choose the first one, yeah. right? So when you're talking about addiction, like it's all good going, oh, you made this choice, you you picked it up. Yeah, yeah. we did. That the initial, first, the, that initial, initial one, one we what, did. I've interviewed people before and I've been, people become addicted from that first try and then they end up, that is a 25-year journey. Yeah. So they get, it never ends then. That's a session yeah. that starts and it doesn't end. It wasn't, no one fucking would have done Only it. 8% of lifelong addicts get clean. 8% and 72% of addicts are heroin and crack cocaine addicts. Mm. So, you know, there's a huge, huge number of people who need to understand those people like me. There's the other real solid people out there. I'm not going to name check anyone today, but we, you know, there are other people like me out in those communities doing massive work and they're ex-cons, they're ex-users, they're ex-dealers, but they're really trying to promote a positive message and that's what I really want to get across today, that addicts we do change, prisoners we can turn it around. We are not destined to spend our entire lives sat in a cell and that's what we were told and that's what we were made to believe. Of course. And so for anyone out there who's also maybe struggling and actually wants to follow you directly, yes. the, would the best place to follow you be on TikTok? You do your morning sort of sermon on the TikTok, don't you? Yeah, um, every so um, TikTok, find me Paul Addict Mentor Simmons. Paul Addict Mentor is the best. You can Google it. It's like said, really no, The link easy. will be below. Guys, yeah. so. But uh, TikTok, I do live streams every morning, 9 a.m. till 10 a.m. It is just... It's a place where I just like to have a bit of fun, offer people proper advice. You know, if if an addict or someone with mental health issues has had a bad night, they know they can come on to me. I'm not going to sit there all depressed. I'm actually going to get involved and offer people support. And yeah, they, they seem to work. And guys, if you're watching this on the night that this has been released, me and Paul are going to be live on TikTok after this. So we'll yes. put this out at... So seven o'clock, say nine thirty. Yeah. Is that too late for you? No, that's fine. That's fine. So yeah, yeah nine thirty would be on TikTok. So guys, jump on, follow both of us, yeah. and go from there. But like I said, you've got loads of really positive stuff coming up: TV programs, documentaries, yeah. everything. So it's non-stop. It's only growing, influence growing, the reach growing, and helping more and more people. So like I said, congratulations on what you've done so far. I'll be following your journey, and anything I can do to help promote you, please let me know. And obviously, we'd love to get you back on the channel for a part two at some stage down the line. Love that. Big up KRN TV. Obviously. Much appreciated. So, like I said, much appreciated again for the opportunity. And um, yeah, guys, follow Paul, support Paul, and keep doing what you're doing, brother. Stay on the path. Thank you very much, brother. Thank you.